All right, so here's what I'd like to do. I thought about this a lot. I thought as we go through it. Now, the one thing, two chapters, a lot of information. I mean, it's a lot of information, and yet what you're going to see is that there, there are two great things that the church is facing. Uh, one is persecution. The other is seduction by the culture. And uh, honestly, down through the ages, those things haven't changed a whole lot. And so when I share that there's a lot of information, it's just that we're dealing with seven different churches. And you may, you know, you may see that you get some things confused, and that's okay, especially if you've never really been through this passage before. So I thought about how we would handle it, and I started thinking about the promise that's made at the beginning of the book of Revelation. And the promise is made that the one who reads this book is blessed, the, the hearers of these words are also blessed. They receive a blessing. And so uh, since um, the thing that changes us to begin with is God's word, we're going to take the time right now to read through these two chapters. Okay, And so you guys follow along as we go. There's a few Bibles underneath. Uh, or if you just want to close your eyes and listen a little bit, <coughs> this is Jesus speaking to the churches in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. And one thing that I would have you to know is these are Jesus' words, okay? John is not making them up for him. These are the words that Jesus speaks to the seven churches. And so beginning in verse 2, to the angel of the church, I'm sorry, in verse 1, chapter 2, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring uh, patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is the paradise of God. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, The words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to, build, to put up stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent, if not, I will come to you, soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth he who has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches to the one who conquers i will give some of the hidden manna and i will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it and to the angel of the church in thyatira write the words of the son of god who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, 
who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira who, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you, I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you, you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches." And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie, behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world, to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works, you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say I am rich, I have prospered and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold re refined by fire so that you may be rich in white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him, and he with me. The one who conquers... I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Would you pray with me, please? 
Our Father in God, as we come uh, to these two chapters in which uh, Jesus um, not only speaks to the church, but also examines uh, these seven congregations. Father, may we be reminded that that's the way that, uh, that's the way that he, uh, he approaches things, that he operates. That, that, Father, he comes to us, he affirms within us the things that, um, that we are doing well. And then, Father, if we're listening, he offers that word of correction. Even if we're not listening, he offers the word of correction. And our job then is to respond. And so, Father, we thank you for what we're about to examine, and we realize, Father, that it's, it's not simply about these seven churches, but it's about the church in general. It's about each individual life. And so this morning, Father, I pray that you would remove any obstacles that are here. I pray, Father, that we can be together, that we might be very focused um, and Father, the only way that that unity comes and that focus comes is through your Holy Spirit. And so we invite your Spirit to be at work here. We know that your Spirit is present, but we invite Him into our lives. And I pray, Father, that right now, as I speak these words, that it's the prayer of every heart um, who is present this morning, that they would open themselves to you and to your guidance. May we truly be a church who hear from you. Um, and we listen, and we heed and obey. And so, as the words um, state, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church, to the churches, the congregations, and that includes each one of us who make up Crossroads Christian Church. And so, Father, may you bless this time. May you use it, for we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I have to tell you, I, I kind of started Wednesday evening in the same manner um, by explaining that one of the challenges in preaching any passage of Scripture is just kind of taking away from it what, what we need. And, um, and, and sometimes that means that we won't cover every detail. I, I spoke with them on, on Wednesday evening, the, the folks who were here, and I shared with them that one of my fears about going through this series on Revelation is just that, that somewhere along the line I'm going to disappoint somebody because I didn't talk about the exact thing that they wanted me to talk about or to touch on. And, and, and honestly, you know, I have to examine this and what we need as a congregation. And so when we go through, understand that there are details that we may not really talk about. But if you were here last week and the week before as we explained this, sometimes my fear with this book is that people get so caught up in the details that they miss the major point, that they miss exactly what God is talking about. And so what that leads to, and I know you're going to get tired of hearing this, but it leads to all sorts of theories about helicopters and and military machines that look like scorpions and all that kind of stuff. And, and when we do that, we do a great injustice to, to, to God's word, I believe, uh, because there's a, there's a bigger point, there's a bigger picture that he wants us to see. The, the, the analogy that I use is that it's really sometimes as we approach this book, we don't see the forest because we're too busy looking at all the trees. And we want to see the forest. We want to see the big picture. And so... Honestly, the big picture here is that Jesus walks among his churches. He is present in, in his churches. Chapter 1 ends in that way, and chapter 2 begins in that way. He, he makes that promise from the one who holds the seven stars in his hands to the, you know, the one that walks among the, the, the lampstands, that he is in control, that he should be at the center of everything that we do because he's the one that's in charge. In fact... Um, some very helpful information uh, as we go through these two chapters. Number one, Jesus walks among the churches. There is not a congregation, if they are truly the church, that does not find their identity from Jesus and Jesus alone. Otherwise, they're just a social club. You guys follow that? If Jesus isn't a part of it, then it's just a social club. I mean, you may be all happy and feel good, but if Jesus isn't really there then you're not really accomplishing what he expects and what he desires, what his will is. 
Jesus walks among the churches. That means that he will be involved. Um, and, and, and so uh, what it denotes is that he's the one who's in control. Uh, he holds the angels in his hand. One little word about that. I've heard people translate this before or interpret it before, I should say, as the, the, the angels are the pastors of those seven churches. And that's not really true. Nowhere else is the word angel used in that kind of a way. And what, what people have done is an angel is a messenger and pastors are messengers. And so, uh, but, but honestly, what it's stating is that that's who he is. He is the one who holds the angels in his hands. He is not an angel. He is above the angels. In fact, he even holds those angels. Now, what it does mean is that there is an angel to each one of these churches. Now, think about that. If that's true and was true then, then it's true today. That any congregation where Jesus is at the center, he is at the head, that there are angels. There is an angel who is assigned to us. And I'm thinking about Greg's song because he kind of mentioned that, that there are angels watching and so he holds the angels in his right hand, the scripture says. And he walks among the, the, uh, the, the lampstands, that he is the head of every congregation. So, so that's a little bit of helpful information there. Also notice that he begins each address with a description of himself. And we're going to go back and look at those just kind of quickly. And, and again, I, I, in order for us to... to uh, I thought about this last night after I finished. I thought this sermon is going to be three hours long. And, and I promise that it won't be, but, but it means that we kind of have to move. Uh, verse 1 of chapter 2. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Did you just lose me? Shit. Am I back? All right. We did this the other night. I may not be able to sit down. We'll see what happens. All right. These are the words of him who... Am I on? Am I on? All right. How about, we've got to shorten this wire, is what the deal is. Hey, just bring me a handheld. Somebody, bring me that one, Paul. <laughs> All right, here we go. The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Skip down to verse 8. These are the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. Verse 12. The words of him who, who has the sharp two-edged sword. Verse 18. The words of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Verse 3. The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Verse 7. The words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will open. Verse 14, the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Now, the thing that I want you to notice is that he begins every, each and every address to the churches with a description of himself. Now, why do you think that's important? I mean, why is that important? I mean, John, and by the way, notice this, that in chapter 1, he has just described himself, or John describes him. He turns around, remember he says, I turned around and I looked at the voice, you know, I saw the voice that was speaking to me, and this is what I saw. Every one of these descriptions comes from that vision. Every one of these descriptions comes from the vision that John saw of him. And I think that what that, what that should say... Just like last week, whenever we covered this, we talked about how Jesus is truly the Son of God. He is God 
in the flesh. He is fully God. He is fully man. That's another thing that we looked at. And he is the Messiah. He is the one who's come to rescue. And I think that that's the significance that as he begins the address, listen, this isn't just a pastor who is speaking to them. This isn't an angel from God who is speaking to them. This is Jesus whose eyes burn like fire, who is full of wisdom. Remember the description of of his white hair and, and how we talked about how that's a description of wisdom? This is Jesus who who is the first and the last, whose whose very word is like a double-edged sword. This is from Jesus. And I think that's the significance of it. He begins the address each and every time with something that they need to hear, that they need to be reminded of. I am the one who was dead and is now alive. And so he begins each and every address with a with a description of himself, because that's what the churches need. They need to know that the word is from him. Two phrases are used over and over again. The first is, I know. Um, You see that, I know your works. That's a little bit, actually what I want to do with that is is to tell you that it's the same today. When When Jesus looks at Crossroads Christian Church and any other congregation here in Danville, we're kind of unique today in that, when he's writing to the church at Ephesus and he's writing to the church at Smyrna, he's talking about the entire church. The problem that we run into is this. We have so many divisions within the church. So know this morning that what we're going to deal with is how he is speaking to crossroads. And, and, and he knows our works. He knows the good things that we do. He knows the good things that individuals do. And that's the thing I want you to, to kind of take a hold of this morning is that as God's congregation as his church you have two distinct identities in that one is that you do very much have a personal relationship with God but that personal relationship with God is what helps to make up the body of believers here at Crossroads Christian Church and so it's not only that you have a personal identity with Jesus Christ you also have a corporate identity with Jesus Christ And that's very important. What happens in your life is the life of the church. And what happens in the life of the church should be a part of your life. You guys get that? Say yes if you do. I know it's a little, see, people don't like it because that means that someone else is really involved in my relationship. And yes, it's true. See, what Jesus tells us is that we have a vertical relationship with him. That's our personal relationship. But we also have a responsibility horizontally across the board. We have a responsibility to one another. And that, that is being the church. And that's for each one of us. It's not just for your pastors and your elders and those that you think that ought to be doing the things that you want them to do. It's for you as well. And that's the major problem we have in our society today with the church is people miss it. It's always for someone else. It's not for you, and it is for you. These words that John writes, the words of Jesus, are for each individual who who is here this morning as well as for the corporate body of the church at Crossroads Christian Church. It's for each one of us. And he knows. He knows. He knows what you do. He knows what your hang-ups are. He knows what your stumbling blocks are. He knows it all. The second phrase that repeats or comes over and over again, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And that's where we get the, the title for this morning's message, and that is, do we hear him? Do we hear him? All right. So now, Jesus' approach as he goes through the churches is this, it's, it's actually uh, fourfold, I guess. Uh, he identifies himself. Secondly, he gives a word of affirmation. He tells them what they're doing well. He offers a word of correction. And then finally, he gives a promise, an enduring promise or a motivating promise to any who overcome this world. And so we'll just jump right into it, and we'll look at the words of, of affirmation to begin with. First of all, the church at, at Ephesus. Um, the church at Ephesus, what Jesus says to them is, I, you know, I see, I know your hard work, 
your patient endurance and your vigilant guarding of the truth. Essentially, what, what they did well was they, they handled God's word very well. Um, they guarded against false teaching. In fact, one of the things he says later on is you don't, you don't put up with the work of the Nicolaitans. When they come in and try to disrupt things, you don't put up with that. And so I have this, you have this going for you. Um, the church at Smyrna, Jesus notes their suffering in light of tribulation. Smyrna, by the way, Smyrna is, uh, later on we know a little bit more about Smyrna because Polycarp is the bishop there. Polycarp was a student uh, of John, uh, the, the writer of Revelation, the Apostle John. And, and Polycarp, if you remember, dies when he's in his 80s. He is burned at the stake, and they ask him, you know, they, they're going to tie him down. And he makes this tremendous statement of faith. He says, you don't need to tie me down because the same faith that has served me for over 80 years um, will hold me to this stake. And Polycarp went to his death, burned in the flames, singing hymns of praise before God. And so that's Smyrna. And what Jesus notes is that they've suffered greatly in light of the tribulation. Remember, as we go through these things, two great enemies of the church. One is persecution. It's going to happen. Jesus said that. Jesus said, um, they will hate you because they hated me first. And, and so persecution is going to happen. It should take place. If we're doing the things of God, we should be persecuted. It's not something that we should uh, come to, to think that, well, we're good people. Why are people picking on us? Because they hate Jesus. Because they hate God. They don't want anyone who tells them how to live. And so persecution is one of the great enemies of the church. But the second is probably, and, and this is the thing, at the heart of all of this is cultural seduction. And that's what you'll see. In any of the churches that have a word of correction towards them, it's because they're being seduced by their society. They're, they're giving in to the society around them. And so Ephesus and Smyrna, those are the things that they're doing well. Pergamum is the next church on the list. And Pergamum is uh, told that Jesus acknowledges their courageous witness, that they are being very straightforward in presenting Christ to to the world or in the world that they live in, in the city that they live in, even though it's the heart of, um, it's the throne of Satan is what he makes the statement. It's the very throne of Satan, and yet you're being faithful witnesses for me. Um, then you have, uh, oh, I'm sorry. They, they live in the city of Satan's throne. They, they've experienced martyrdom. That's where Antipas has been put to death, and yet they still are faithful in, in their witness and in their testimony. Um, Thyatira is the next uh, church that is mentioned. Thyatira mentions their love, their faith and service, and how they are growing and developing, that they're kind of on the move. I mean, they're, they're experiencing growth, not only physical growth, but they're also experiencing spiritual growth, that they're becoming to look more and more like disciples of, of Jesus. Philadelphia, uh, Jesus acknowledges their courage even though they have little to work with and a lot coming against them. I want to highlight Philadelphia just a little bit because of that fact that he makes the statement that you're little in your strength. And, and I got to tell you that for years, for years I really struggled with um, when I was younger about uh, all the churches that close across the country and some of them are small churches. And being from a small congregation, the very first congregation I preached in, I know the spirit that was there. I know how much they did. And so I kind of brag on Philadelphia a little bit. Philadelphia basically is a church that, where Jesus says, hey, you're little, but you're mighty. And, and some of us, you all know of examples of that, don't you? I mean, it could be as an, an individual. They may not look at themselves as being very gifted and yet, that they just they're just tremendous in their witness and in the things that they do for God. Or it may be a little congregation, you know, very few in number, maybe even very poor, but they do some mighty things for God. And, and that's the church at Philadelphia. He says, I, I want to note that you have great courage even though you have little to work with. Um the imagery in verses 7 and 8 are, are beautiful as well because what he starts with is this is from the one who opens doors that cannot be shut 
and from the one who shuts doors that cannot be opened. And then right away he says to them, listen, here's what I'm going to do for you. I am going to open a door that no one can shut. I mean, what, what, what would you do if God showed up in your life and said, I'm going to open this door and there's not a person. There is, there is, not, there, there is not a power that can come against what I'm about to do because that's the promise that he makes to them. I'm going to open this door and I'm going to make those who have persecuted you, who have put you down, I'm going to make them acknowledge who you are through me. And, and so, again, that's, that's the imagery that's there. And then finally, Sardis and Laodicea. Um, this, this is kind of sad, and, and many of you probably already knew this, but in these two cities, the church receives no affirming message. In these two cities, in these two churches, they don't receive anything that they're doing well. You know what I'm convinced of? There are churches across the nation that close every year. And some of them close. Some of them close because they finally give an end to the pressures. And, you know, they, they go and they join somewhere else and things go well. But I'm convinced that some churches close in our culture across this country because... God has finally removed their light. He's just said, there's nothing good to say about you. And so I'm going to put out the light. I mean, it's a promise that he makes to Ephesus. Don't think that it doesn't happen. Because he says to them, hey, unless you repent and change, I will take the lampstand. You will not be my light. And, and, and so... Sardis and Laodicea are dangerously close to that happening. So, so that's the affirming message to them. Now, here's the question that I had. Um, oh, by the way, in Sardis, there are a few individuals who have remained faithful. I mean, they've remained true. And he says that for them, I'm not going to hold them accountable for what the rest of you are doing. And, and that's a little bit of hope. That also says that in each and every congregation, there are still some people there who are trying to make things right. And, and, and that's a, a great promise. Um, so what would God say to us? I mean, honestly, Crossroads of Danville. And again, I've already noted this, but we can't speak for the rest of the church in Danville because honestly, um, a lot of churches, just we just don't want, for whatever reason, maybe it's because we're busy within, within our own congregation, whatever it is, but we just don't work well together. I mean, I'm just going to say that. We don't work well together. We should. We should. There should be more involvement between congregations. But we don't work well together. It, it, it's almost, you know, it, 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 it really is. It has to be a frustration. It has to be one of the things that God would complain about in the church in, in any city here in the United States because there are so many divisions. There are so many denominations. So, so this morning, we, we can only speak to our own situation. And so Crossroads of Danville, what would he say? And I think this is part of what he would say. There are probably other things. This is just, this is my thought. He, I think Jesus would say that we correctly handle the word of God. We seek to aid people in growing and developing as God's church. We help, and I want you to note this, those who are willing, we help people connect to God's presence, people, and passion. You know, I, I've, in the last couple of weeks, I've had a, cu a couple of people say, well, we just don't feel all that connected. And I'm just going to say it again. I said it Wednesday night. I'm going to say it again. Whose fault is that? I, I mean, we, what, what, do you, what do you want? There are small groups that you can be involved in. And I, I promised myself I wasn't going to do this right here. But there are things that you can be involved in. There are ministries that you can plug into you know, what do you want? I mean, do you, do you want a one-on-one -on -one meal with me? Well, get in line. I'll be happy to do that. Jennifer and I will be happy to do that. You choose the place and the time, and you pay for the meal. Just kidding. Just kidding. But, you know, it, we are to be the church together, and we'll do what we can but if it means that you're simply saying you want to be coddled and all that kind of stuff, grow up. 
Grow up and coddle somewhere, someone else because that's your job. Look for somebody that you should be taking care of. That's your job. And, and if more of us would do that, by the way, hey, I used to think the same thing. I used to think the same thing at, at, at Lincoln whenever I was there about my junior year. I started to look around, and I was like, you know, the guys that were really courting me to come here, they don't pay a whole lot of attention to me anymore. And there's a reason for that because I'm a junior by this time, and I ought to be involved in the work, not receiving all of the blessings and all of the, the being courted and the, the coddling. It's time to get involved and be involved, to, 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 to be uh, aware that your part is to help bring others in, uh, making disciples. And so those who are willing, we, we try to connect them to God's presence, people, and passion. And, and what that really leads to is this question. How do you contribute? And don't hear it as a negative one because we're on words of affirmation. Honestly, in some way you contribute. It could be that you contribute financially to the budget of the church. It could be that you contribute financially to missions work. It could be that you just simply are here and you're cheerful as we are here together and you encourage someone either by your smile or you're welcoming them. You're, you're helping them to feel a part of what's happening here. It could be that you're involved in worship. How do you contribute? In, in other words, if Jesus is speaking to you, and he should be right now, what affirming word would he extend to you? What would he say that you're doing well? What would he say that that you contribute well what would he say is is your great strength in following him it could be your faith it could be your joy it could be your peace it, it could be your openness just before service started a couple people were talking outside talking to me and I can tell you that one of them in sharing with me greatly helped the other individual because they're both facing the same physical struggle and ailment. How do you contribute? Because when Jesus speaks to us, he says to us, these are the things that I think you're doing well. And he affirms that within us. All right. Um, so now comes the hard part, the correction. And in the church at Ephesus, the way that God corrects them is he comes on the scene and he says, listen, I know I know that you guys do a really good job about handling the word of God, that you correct false teachers, that you discipline people when they need it. But you've abandoned your first love. And really what what Jesus is saying to them is you're not very loving. Do you know any churches like that? Do you know any preachers like that? There are some people who believe that I'm a preacher like that. And, and at times, I will, I will confess this, I went through a very ugly period of time in which I maybe was a preacher like that. I mean, I really wanted to discipline, I really wanted to correct, I really wanted, and I was kind of ugly. I mean, and this is the way you'd say it. I mean, Jesus would show up and he'd say, Miles, listen, listen, Miles, I, I really appreciate how you teach Scripture and, and the way that you preach and all that, your passion that's there. I mean, I appreciate all that stuff, but dude, you are a jerk. You know, has God ever done that to you? Because that's exactly what he's saying to Ephesus. You've forsaken your first love. You remember, and, and, and I, I'm not, please don't hear me as denoting that we need to correctly handle the word, the word of truth. I mean, that's a great need, in our, especially in our culture today. But at the same time, you remember what Jesus said? I mean, the table's not here anymore. But he said, this is my command to you, that you love one another. That you love. By this, people will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And so he shows up at Ephesus, and he says, I appreciate all the things you're doing. You don't put up with any false teaching. You've corrected those who said that they were apostles, and you found out that they're not. I mean, I like all that stuff. That's great. But you're jerks. So now, correct it, or I will come and take the lampstand. Um, 
the church at Smyrna and Philadelphia. Yeah, I know I'm skipping ahead with Philadelphia. But Smyrna and Philadelphia, there's no correction. And can I tell you why? It's, because, it's simply, it's one reason. They have not fallen into the culture around them. They have not been seduced. Now, they are being persecuted. You remember what I said about Philadelphia? They're a little itty-bitty church. They have very little to work with, but they've still been faithful. And, and so Smyrna, on the other hand, is a pretty good-sized church. Let me tell you a quick story about Smyrna because I just love this. Back in that day, um, acting was, was very popular. In Greek and Roman uh, philosophy and in, in, their, in their culture, Acting and, and the stage play was very popular. Now, one of the struggles that happened, and this, this, this is the honest truth, that a lot of times what happens, if you were a male and you were involved in as an actor, that that was a part of the way you made your living, that what happened was you were exposed to homosexuality. And, and so, because of that, it was, it was kind of connected. There was this connection that the church made that in culture, that's a struggle that would happen within um, the, the profession of acting. And so if you were an actor who became a Christian, all of a sudden you had to choose a different profession because the church really didn't support the arts in that way. They didn't see them as being important. And so a local congregation had brought an actor into the body uh, of believers, and they asked Polycarp and others at, at Smyrna, they asked him this question, is it possible that we could have him teach acting classes so that he's not actually involved? By the way, the reason that part of that happened is that men were the main actors. Most women didn't act at that time. And so the reason that they were exposed to all of this is because any sort of romance ro relationship within the play ended up being played by two men. And a lot of times the women were portrayed by young boys. And so the church really didn't support this. And so they were asked, how can we, how can we handle this? Should we allow him to teach these, these acting classes? And the, and the bishop or, or Polycarp and, and others from Smyrna answered in this way. They said, no, you should not allow him to do that. What should happen is he should be placed. If he has no other training and no other way to make a living, then he should be placed on the same list as the widows are placed on. And he should be supported by the church. That's the kind of thing that went on in the early church. They supported one another in that way. And, and, and so uh, this church wrote back to, to Polycarp, to the, the church at Smyrna, and said, we don't, we're, we're a small congregation. We can't do that. And this is just cool. So Polycarp writes and says, then send him to us. Send him here to Smyrna, and we will take care of him. That's the spirit of the church at, at work. And so they have not been seduced by their culture, but they are being greatly persecuted. And so there's no word of correction. It's just simply a word to hang on. Hang on. Hang on. I know what's going on, but hold on because I'm coming back. Now, there was a church at Pergamum, and Pergamum is told that they put up with heretical teaching. Um, basically, they're putting up with a guy that is the spirit of Balaam, um, and then they also mention the Nicolaitans. Now, I'll tell you that we don't know that much about the Nicolaitans. We do think that it probably had something to do with sexual immorality, idolatry, and that sort of thing. But, but basically, they're putting up with these false teachings. You know, they're allowing things to enter into the life of the church that shouldn't be there. Eating meat sacrificed to idols. Um, being involved in sexual immorality. That could be temple prostitution and all that sort of thing. But whatever it was, they were putting up with it. They were looking the other way. The members of their congregation were involved, and they just simply not touch on it. I remember from years ago... A, a minister that I had who was involved, he was involved in, a, in an affair. Actually, affair after affair after affair. And you know the one theme that he would never preach about? Adultery. You know? The one thing that he would never preach about was adultery. And, and, and so he just kind of looked the other way. He just pretended like it wasn't taking place. 
Um, and, and so they put up with heretical teaching. The church at Thyatira, two groups were present there. One group um, were involved with the person that they called Jezebel. By the way, if you have a daughter or granddaughter, don't name them Jezebel. It's just not a good name, you know. And, and so Jezebel, they put up with the teachings of this woman Jezebel. She, you know, again, it's, it's, it's sexual immorality that's taking place. They practice and they tolerate it. Uh, you know, now, again, think about our culture. Think about some of the decisions that major denominations have made in the last few years. Think about what all has taken place when, is it possible that the same condemnation would be made of some of those denominations and some of those congregations because they tolerate sexual immorality? And folks, honestly, living together, living together outside of the bonds of marriage and being involved sexually is sexual immorality. Being involved in adulterous affairs is sexual immorality. Homosexuality is sexual immorality. And in our culture, we just embrace these things and we tolerate them. And so there's two groups that are present, those who practice and tolerate sexual immorality and those who stood against the practice. And remember what he says to them. There's a group among you who have not, you know, they, they've not bought into this. And so I'm not going to hold them to any other standard than this. You hold on as well. You just keep doing what you're doing. You keep teaching what you're teaching. You keep preaching what you're preaching. You keep living the way that you're living and hold on. Um, then there's Sardis. They're accused of, of apathy. Now, you guys know what apathy is, right? What? Yeah, apathy was, you just gave a great illustration of it. He didn't do anything. You know what apathy is? You know, apathy is, is just not caring. It's not caring at all. And they, they either just don't care or they have been lulled to sleep. Keith Green has a great song called Asleep in the Light. You know, do you see, do you see all the people sinking down? Don't you care? Don't you care? Are you going to let them drown? And, and honestly, there are so many, I believe, churches today who have this spirit of, of apathy. And they're either just asleep or they have been, uh, I'm sorry, they just don't care or they've been lulled to sleep. Laodicea, their blessings have made them lukewarm. Now, I know that we're running out of time. But, and, and again, I mean, this is, this is the challenge I knew that I was going to face. I guess second service, I'm going to have to speak faster. Um, but, but the blessings have kept them lukewarm. Let me tell you just a little bit about Laodicea. Laodicea is probably one of my favorite, and so I have to give you a, a little bit of description of it. He says, I wish you were either hot or cold. Now, that's been preached the wrong way uh, for a long, long time. People say, well, Jesus either wants you to be really hot for him or he wants you to be cold. He, he cares more about those who don't care about him than he does those who are just lukewarm. That's not what he's saying at all. There is a use for hot, and there is a use for cold. Cold refreshes. You guys know that. You come in out of from mowing the yard or raking leaves or whatever, and you come in, and a cold drink of water will do more for you than anything else. You know, I hate to say my my uh, my father-in-law used to say this. He would come down. I worked third shift, and so sometimes they would come down to visit, and uh, he would go out and mow my yard. I miss my father-in-law. Uh, but he would go out and mow my yard, and then he would come in, and he would say to my wife, you reckon the reverend's got a cold beer in the refrigerator? See, cold refreshes. And, and, and hot, you know, it's kind of therapeutic. And, and the thing about Laodicea is they, they lay in a very in, interesting uh, geographic area because on, on one side of them from the mountains came hot water. From the other side came cold water. By the time it reaches them, either one of them were lukewarm. And this lukewarm, if you've ever been, if you were raised out around Old Union and you've ever smelled the water that came out of the taps there, the old rotten egg smell, by the time it would get to Laodicea, that's the kind of water it was. And so if you took a drink of that, you would want to spit it out because it's lukewarm. It's good for nothing. The other thing about Laodicea is they were very wealthy. They were a banking society. Laodicea is one of the only cities after the earthquake in the late 
70s, uh, 70 AD, that didn't need financial aid from the Roman government because they were that wealthy. All right? And Jesus plays off of that. You think that you're rich. You don't need anything from me. Now think about that in our culture. Isn't that true of people in our culture? I, don't, I really don't need Jesus. Everything's good. 